come into play. And decisions are a tough thing. And, you know, how do you make decisions? You know, this morning I got up and I'm sitting here thinking, what should I wear? You know, does this shirt go with this sweater? And, and I'm sitting here thinking, that's the great thing about the new world. Everything goes with everything. You know that? You see people walking down the mall. And, and the other night I was in a halfway decent restaurant picking something up. And, and there was a, a, a man that was about 74 in pajamas. And I said, okay, it's cool. You can wear it, but you know, you can sit there and you say, well, should I wear that? Should I wear that? And you get into to the decisions. And then the, the funny thing, the funniest decision, because you see it in marriage counseling stuff all the time, is where do you want to eat? Okay? The question that will cause a divorce in any couple, you know, I, I remember a conversation one time, where do you want to eat? Well, honey, we can eat anywhere you want to eat. Well, I'm really in the mood for Texas Roadhouse. You know how much I hate it there. Okay, well, where do you want to eat? I told you, it's strictly up to you. Well, you know what really sounds good? Chinese food. Let's get the Chinese restaurant. Oh, I just had Chinese ones. Okay, can, can you think of something else? Okay, can you? And, and that's why McDonald's flourishes. Because <laughs> people just give up and say, let's make the kids happy. I, mean, I don't want to fight anymore. I'm, I'm starved. By this time, I'm thinking about pulling over and eating one of those cows on the side of the road. And people, people struggle with that. We struggle with what to wear. We, we struggle with what do I want to do with my life? You know, I used to, when I was a kid, they tried to push you to have your life planned out by the time you were in junior and high school. Okay? And I remember when Nathan was a freshman in college, and he'd say, I'm not sure what I want to do, and I'd tell somebody about it, you know, and ask people to pray for it, and they, they, people come up and say, he doesn't have to make a decision until he's a junior. And I think, what world am I in? Yeah. This has changed so much and so different that, you know, they plan. And now you got people that are 35 saying, I'm not sure I know what I want to be when I grow up. And, it, and it's a tough thing. It's not an easy thing picking out what you want to do. I don't want to make light of that. It's, it's hard. It's hard knowing what you want to be in the future, what you want to do, and these are all tough decisions. They're decisions that require a lot of prayer. You know, one of the things I did a sermon one time here, and I don't know how many people remember it, because it was probably seven years ago. Raise your hand if you remember this right away, but it was on God made you for something. something. And you know what? Sometimes it's tough for us to find out just what God made us to do. What He called us to be. What it is that He wants us to be. So here's a, here's a major question that we're going to really go into today. Do you involve God in your decisions? You know? Do you ask God to help you? Do you ask God to advise you? And then do you ever listen for God's advice? Or one thing I know that we're all kind of guilty for is that God will give us his advice and we don't like that. <laughs> nah, thank you, Lord, but I, I think I'll stick with this. You know, I remember, I, I truthfully can tell you, bigger than life in college, God told me to go into ministry. I can tell you hearing his voice and hearing him calling, and I said, you must be nuts. I had a minister say one time, well, what did you tell him when you said you must be nuts? I said, you don't make any money, and there's none of the chicks here at school that are looking for a minister. <laughs> and I'm serious. Those are things we say when there's decisions, right? And it can be really hard trying to decide what we want to do. But we have to learn to pray and listen to Him. And then comes an important decision. What do you do when God calls? 
Because I've been with people a lot in my life that have turned God down when he called. I've been with people who've come to see me and said they really felt called to be in the ministry. And they went home and, and they come back in two weeks and said, I'm not doing it. And I say, why? And they say, my wife said she doesn't want me to do it. Those are scary issues. Those are scary things. Those are tough things to get into. And, and what do we do? What do we do when God calls? What do we decide when God calls? And before we talk about this today, let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we have so many decisions. I don't know where to say it starts. What time to set the alarm? Whether I should hit the snooze? Whether I should get up now? Whether I should go fix this in the kitchen first, or do this first, or get dressed first, and, and, and what time should I leave for work, and what time, what should I do when I get there, and it's just so many, many things, and, and we struggle with all the decisions, and then Lord, we hear your word, and we hear your voice, and you ask us to do something, what do we do when those decisions come? Do we come to you? Do we call on you? Do we listen for your voice? Do we follow your voice? Do we read your word? Do we see those things and what happens? Lord, I just ask that you would be with us and help us to know what you want us to do and to make the decisions that you call on us to make. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we're kind of, it's kind of like a two-week thing, but last week we talked about Mary, Joseph, and then us, and today we're going to talk about Mary and Joseph and us. And when we talk about Mary, you know, one of the things is, is what is the biggest job that God ever gave you to do? Can you think about that in your life? Because it may be, it may be really weird. It may not be what you think it is at all. I remember one time getting a phone call from this lady. I think I've told you this story before. But she was perhaps the meanest, nastiest human I've ever talked to on the phone. And she said, do you have a church bus? And I said, yeah. Well, can you pick me up? There was no hi. <laughs> Central Baptist. Do you have a church bus? Yes. Can you pick me up? Yes. Is it wheelchair accessible? No. Forget it. And I said, ma'am, I'll pick you up. I said, we'll find a way to make it work. What's the deal? She said, I lost my sugar, or leg to sugar diabetes, and I can't get any vehicles, and nobody in this stupid town has a wheelchair. So you're starting to see the anger, right? She had a son that beat her up all the time to take her Oxycontin. You know, and I said, uh, I said, I'll come down and pick you up. So I went down and I started every Sunday morning and every Wednesday night. I picked her up, I put the wheelchair in the trunk, I put her in the seat of the car, I drove her to church. After church, I took her home. Okay. And before you know it, she gave her life to Christ. And she gave her life to Christ in April. And we baptized her. And when she gave her life to Christ, she said, I didn't do this because you're a great preacher. <laughs> I thought, well, I hope not. I hope you did it because Jesus called you. She said, I did it because you picked me up in the car. Nobody ever cared to do something like that. Then she died on December the 23rd of that year. And you know, the thing of it is, is it would have been very easy to have heard, Do you have a bus? And just said, yeah, and when she said, hey, kept said, sorry, I couldn't help you hang out. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be very easy? But see, what happens is, is when you hear God, and you do that, you can make a decision that is eternal. By me picking that phone up, by me saying, I'll pick you up, 
by me being a lousy preacher yet a good driver, <laughs> she had found her way to the Holy Spirit and became the Kingdom of Heaven. And you see, we have decisions that we have to make like that. We have things that fall on us that are like that. God has given you an opportunity. He's given you an opportunity in life. He calls on you and he says, I want you to do this for me. I want you to do this for me. I want you to do this for me. And how often do you say yes? And you know, most of the time, you have a pretty solid reason to not do it. You know, a reason that everybody around you will say, yeah, you're fine. If I would have told that story to everybody in the church, they would all laugh and some of them would have said, ooh, because I got this when I started picking her up. We've met her. She's trouble. She is really nasty. Everybody stays away from her. Okay, right? You know those people? Do you know how bad God wants those people? Do you know how bad He wants to love on them? Do you know how bad He wants them in the kingdom? The people that nobody wants to be around. And, and we think about the decisions that we have and the opportunities that we have that we've been given by God. And we think, what was it like for Mary? What was the decision process like for Mary? I, I, I was at a conference one time and some guy said something that was just kind of mind-boggling to me. But he said, what if Mary was like the seventh choice? Did you ever think of that? What if Mary was like the seventh choice and all the other girls said no? Because do you think people in the church say no? Do you think that people today, that Jesus asked some very important stuff, he asked them to do, and they say no. No. I'm not doing it. No. And we look at the scripture again. Luke 1, 34-38. Mary asked the angel, how can this happen? I am not married. How can I be pregnant? How can I have a baby? How can this be? I am not married. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come down to you, and God's power will come over you. So your child will be called the Holy Son of God. Your relative Elizabeth is also going to have a son, even though she is old. No one thought she could ever have a baby, but in three months she will have a son. Nothing is impossible for God. Which, when you get asked by something, for God to do something for you, and all them reasons the devil gives you not to do it, what's your first answer? Is your first answer, nothing is impossible for God? Can't do that, can't do that, can't do that, can't do that. Nothing is impossible for God. So Mary says, I am the Lord's servant. Let it happen as you have said, and the angel left her. Mary says, yes. And as I said, do you think someone else would have said no? Because plenty of people say no. People say no all the time. God gives us great opportunities. And we say no. And, and how did Mary come to an answer so quick? Did you ever, how did yes come so fast? That's one of the things, when you think about all the reasons that you love Mary and you respect Mary for the, the decisions that she made, that she didn't have any foretelling. She didn't have any knowledge that this was coming up in her life. She didn't have time to plan and, well, you know what, I'm going to deal with this, I'm going to deal with this, I'm going to deal with this, I'm going to deal with this. God came, said this to her, and she immediately said, yes. Yes. Isn't that how she should be? And when God comes and says, I need you to do this, I need you to do this, you know, what should happen in our busy schedules? Shouldn't they just melt? See, Mary had a busy schedule. Mary was betrothed. She was going to get married. She had a wedding coming up. I, I love it because I, I, I imagine I, I deal with brides. Did you know that? I deal with brides. I deal with grooms. I don't deal with wedding planners. Did it once. Made a pact. Never do a wedding again. Well, I'm sorry. I did it twice. One of the wedding planners, after the wedding, lost the marriage license. No longer. 
couple say, give it to the give it to the wedding planner. We want you to give it to the wedding planner. That's what we're paying you a hundred dollars and her three thousand. Give it to the wedding planner. And I gave it to the wedding planner and she lost the license. And I told the elders after the second experience, I will never do a wedding with a wedding planner again. I'm done. Finished. But can you imagine going to a bride and groom and saying, hey, you get married in three weeks. We want you to go on a mission trip. What? Why? We, but no, 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 listen. It calls for your skills. You have a special skill set. God has given you a special skill set. If you go on this mission trip, you're going to make all the difference in the world. We are getting married in three weeks. What is wrong with you, Pastor? What is wrong? Right? You see that happening? You see how crazy that is? But here's even crazier. Yes, I'll have the Lord's baby. Yes, I'll be an outcast in society. Yes, I'll let everybody be little me. Yes, I'll be right there on the borderline of being stoned. Yes, I'll be right there to where the man I'm betrothed to may walk away and leave me forever. But if this is what God wants, I'll do it. I'll do it. I won't say no. And she believed her message was because it was from God. Because she knew, she knew that she was meeting with the angel Gabriel. And a lot of us are saying, well, you know, if an angel came and asked me to go on a mission trip, I'd be there. Well, I don't know how you know the voice of God. I don't know if it's in some scriptures that you read. I don't know how it is, but the voice of God is very evident to us all or listen. But the question is, is, does this impact you? Does it impact you when God talks to you? And when He says, I want you to do this? Or are you able to find excuses not to do it? So Mary, and, and what she did, and the decision that she made to follow God was just completely amazing. And so then we look at Joseph. And we look at Joseph, we have to first look in the mirror and ask ourselves, what is my ministry? What is my ministry? Today, Dave's Sunday School class, one of the things that it was addressing, and I had to leave a little early. I'm not sure he actually used the verse, but we are all members of a royal priesthood. Which is what his sermon was. It's not sermon. I apologize, remember? <laughs> which is really funny. If you're there. Uh, <laughs> In his Sunday school lesson, what what I was talking about is you, you know we all are in a priesthood, and and the thing of it is is that we all have ministries. Did you know that? If you're a follower of Christ, you have a ministry. So what is your ministry? <clears throat> what is it that you do for Jesus? What is it that He has called you to do that you have said yes? That you go out and focus and concentrate on Him every day. Now when you get up in the morning, you ask Him, please help me to be the best at what you've called me to do today. Help me to be the best as I'm doing this. Help me to make an impact for your kingdom. Help, help me to make it for you. What is your ministry? And, and I'm going to tell you, if you have a ministry, is there any conflict with your life, with your ministry and your life? Yes. If it does not conflict with your life, it's not your ministry. Okay? Because ministry is never easy. It is never smooth. It is never a perfect thing. What do we know? The ministry and the gospel of Jesus Christ is going to offend people. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah? We've got a bunch of sleepy Buckeye fans. The ministry of Jesus Christ is going to offend people. How do we know that? They crucified him. He did things I can't do. He fed thousands of people. He made the dead rise. He made the lame walk. He healed the blind and they crucified him. So if they did that to you, are you going to conflict with what's going on in the world? And the also thing you're going to have to deal with is the conflict with culture. Culture's not going to like what you're doing. And you're also going to realize that it's going to take away from 
what you want to do. You've got things that you want to do. And if you're totally focused on the ministry of Jesus Christ, you're going to miss out on things that you want to do. You're going to have to give that up. Right? And, and we forget, when we become Christians, when we become followers of Christ, there's a saying that we've had for years. I gave my life to Jesus. Oh yeah? Do you remember the day that you said, I gave my life to Jesus? And actually, it reminds me of seeing, I saw this crazy movie one time with Burt Reynolds and Dom DeLuise. And it was hilarious. It was called The End. And this guy had cancer, and he thought he was going to die. And so he was trying to commit suicide. And Dom DeLuise was a homicidal maniac, and he was always trying to kill Burt Reynolds to help him out. And it was really funny. And they went out in the ocean, and Dom DeLuise was trying to drown him. And he couldn't swim. And when he was out there, he got the news, somebody yelled it to him that the test was wrong and he didn't even have cancer. But before he, found, before he found out that news, he was trying to get in out of the water because he really didn't want to drown. And as he was trying to get in, and as he got closer, he said, Lord, I'll give you 100% of everything that I've got. And then his feet hit the ground. And it became 80%. And then the knees got to, got to knees and became 50%. And he said, you know, by the time the water was just at his ankles, he said, I'll do it for you every once in a while, Lord. Aren't we kind of like that? Isn't that kind of how we are? You know, when it's really scary that we say we'll do all this stuff, but what a difference in the world that it makes. I, I watched David Lamb this week. Well, not this week. It's been about two months now. He finally got the call to do his dream. He went down to a village and translated one of the books of the New Testament in their language. And he left his wife, their five or six babies. If you watch this, Dave, you've got a bunch. I can't remember if it's five or six, but you, you win. I had four, you win. He went to this place where there's all these diseases and all these snakes. He said that, that the amount of people that are killed by snakes in this region it's just unbelievable. And so his wife was there. He's going for two months. And why did he go down there? He went down there to translate the gospel of Jesus Christ to the people who have never heard of him. Is that awesome? And we say, oh, he's a special person. He's a special person. God has called you to do something just as special. And what have you done with it? Because it might take away from what we want. I'm sure that Dave did not want to leave his wife and beautiful kids for two months to go do that. That's not his dream. He wishes they could be side by side, but these people need the gospel. They need to know Jesus. So he went. Matthew 10, 20-26. While Joseph was thinking about this, an angel from the Lord came to him in a dream. The angel said, Joseph, the baby Mary is... Uh, will have is from the Holy Spirit. Go ahead and let him marry her. Then after her baby is born, name him Jesus, and he will save his people from their sins. So the Lord's promise came true, just as the prophet had said. A virgin will have a baby boy, and he will be called Emmanuel, which means God is with us. After Joseph woke up, he and Mary were soon married, but the Lord's angel, uh, just as the Lord's angel told him to do, they did not sleep together before her baby was born. Then Joseph named him Jesus. A dream. You see, I forget, I think we forget sometimes that Joseph, he made a life-changing decision based on a dream. You know, you can think, you know, I remember, I made a lot of money with Kmart when I did really well, and I told my dad that I was quitting Kmart, going into the ministry in Portsmouth, Ohio, and he looked at me and he said, how can you make such a stupid decision when you have children? How can you drag them into that and give up all that money and do that? And I said, it's what God wants me to do. And some of you people don't know this. My dad didn't speak to me for five months. My mom dragged dad down to a church service and he saw baptism. I think he actually saw three baptisms. And he started crying and kind of told me he was really sorry. But you know what? Dad didn't have to tell me he was sorry. 
Because I understood that. Because what God asks us to do doesn't make sense with the world. Oh yeah? What God asks you to do doesn't make sense with the world. Most world people will think you're weird, you're a freak, some kind of religious fanatic. They do not understand it. But it takes faith. It takes faith in God to change your life on a dream. It takes faith in God to understand when God has called you to do something. And have you heard God's call? Have you ever had, heard, felt God ask you to do something? Become involved in something? And you let a lot of things talk you out of it? Well, what did you say? And then we come to us. How do we react to God's call? <coughs> How are our decisions made? You know, here's a really tough decision. Whose side are we on? You know, I, I, I've learned a long time ago that there's the white and the black as far as decision making. But the wonderful thing that we have as human beings that we love to discuss is that big part that's in the middle of it called the gray area. Have y'all heard of the gray area? Uh, there's some wiggle room there. This is the tax account. There's some wiggle room there. It's a little bit of gray area and we can kind of do this or fit this or do this or do this. And there's all kinds of life, that, things in life that we can discuss as in the gray area. And believe it or not, if you want to look it up in the Bible, Jesus discussed the gray area. Okay? And it is in John 8, 39-47. People said to Jesus, Abraham is our father. Jesus replied, if you were Abraham's children, you would do what Abraham did. Instead, you want to kill me for telling you the truth that God gave me. Abraham never did anything like that, but you are doing exactly what your father does. Don't accuse us of having someone else as our father. They said, we just have one father and he is God. <coughs> Jesus answered, if God were your father, you would love me. Because I came from God and only from him. He sent me. I did not come on my own. Why don't you understand what I'm talking about? Can't you hear what I'm saying? Your father is the devil and you do exactly what he wants. He has always been a murderer and a liar. There's nothing truthful about him. He speaks on his own and everything he says is a lie. Not only is he a liar himself, but he is the father of all lies. Everything I've told you is true, and you still refuse to have faith in me. Can any of you accuse me of sin? You cannot. Why won't you have faith in me? After all, I'm telling you the truth. Anyone who belongs to God will listen to this message. But if you refuse to listen, it's because you don't belong to God. You see, you're either a child of God or a child of the devil. And people will say, oh, that's, that's so mean. But are we a child of God? How do you know if you're a child of God? If you're a child of God, you listen to God. It makes the decision making really easy. You know that? It makes the decision making really easy. You know when you're doing things for God. You know when you're doing things for people. You know when you're doing things you shouldn't be doing. You know when you're doing things you shouldn't be doing. You know. The Holy Spirit reveals it to us. It lets us know. We're quite aware of what we do. We like to hide our awareness, right? Until we go into court. Now, I didn't know that the speed limit wasn't 85, Your Honor. <laughs> and you get that terrible thing. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. You know that's what God says? People who don't know they're guilty from offending his laws. Ignorance is no excuse. We have all the opportunity in the world to find out. We have all the opportunity in the world to do what our Father asks. When he gives us things to do, we know what it is he wants us to do. We know that there's a million things that we can put up there that are so much more important to him than him. You know that? I mean, it can be really stupid things. And, and, and we can find out that, that we can put it in front of God. But 
But when it comes down to this, it'll always involve a decision. Because that's what it is. We, we tell people, you know, when I was a kid, I even remember an invitation being called decision time. Anybody else remember that? At the end of the church service, they would say, it's time for decision time. You have to make your decision.